Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. This is episode 340. It's uh, a year at Mission Hill, which is uh, a school uh, that we'll be hearing a lot about. Uh, we have the teach some teachers here. We've got a parent here. We've got the uh, uh, the principal, the headmaster here. The director. Um, the director, sorry. Um, so why don't we go around and just uh, introduce the people who are here and um, we'll kind of take it from there. But just start with a little brief uh, introduction. So if we could start with uh, Amy. Oh, your microphone's muted, Amy. Oh. Um, we lost your audio. Is it back now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there I go. Okay. My name is Amy Valens. Uh, I'm the one of the filmmaking team that uh, spent a year in and out of Mission Hill uh, as a result of an earlier film that I made called August to June with my husband Tom, who followed my class in California. Great. Is that enough? <laughs> That's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. sure. um, my name is Okaikor I.E. Price. I am here in New Jersey. I'm also an organizer for IDEA on the team of schools and school leaders. And I'm also a teacher, um, as well as a grad student working on my doctorate in design of learning environments at Rutgers. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Zidman. I'm a um, resident of Boston and a parent at Mission Hill School, and our son's in the third grade there. Sorry, second grade. I didn't hear him say. <laughs> um, and he's been there since uh, since kindergarten. Yes. Um, my name is David Lloyds. I am a digital organizer for the Institute for Democratic Education in America, and I've been kind of spearheading the uh, Facebook page and just some of the social media efforts. So. And I'm also a teacher and a blogger and activist. And looks like she might be frozen there. Oops, it does. Yeah, she'll join us in a second. Um, Monica, how about you? Want to introduce yourself? Hey guys, Monica Hardy in Loveland, Colorado, where I am we are experimenting with the intersection of city and school. Looking forward to tonight. Hey, guys. Hey, Monica. Hey, Monica. Hey, Monica. And uh, I'm Sam Shaltain, a part of the IDEA team and also a part of the team that's trying to bring uh, a year at Mission Hill to as many folks as possible. And just a writer and an educator and very excited to be among this group of folks. So let's say, um, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher. Uh, my name is Chris Sloan. I teach English and media in Salt Lake City at Judge Memorial. And uh, let's say, you know, I, I'm completely new to Mission Hill. You know, what is it? Um, what, what goes on there? And, you know, a little bit about uh, how you all came together. Oh, why don't I start a little bit? And uh, then, Bob, I, I see we've lost... Um, uh, Genera for the minute. Hopefully, we'll get her back because she's she's really the one who should say this. But um, uh, Mission Mission Hill uh, was started 16 years ago by Deb Meyer. It's what's called a pilot school, which means that uh, am I on? Is it working? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, which it, it's called a pilot school, which means that it has certain autonomies, but it is part of the Boston public school system. Pilot schools are able to um, to decide their curriculum. They have certain budget uh, abilities that they can do that uh, other 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 I just muted her for a second. Oh. Nothing personal. 
I don't know if she could hear what was going on, but there was an audio and video loop there, Amy. Sorry. So, yeah, I think you'll come back on here shortly. Hey, Shay will jump right in with his beep up sing. Okay, sorry about that. Should be good soon. Um, so does someone want to pick up with that? I mean, that was well, nice. Uh, Janera's back. Maybe she could... She could. Janera, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, um, Janera Williams. I teach at Mission Hill School, um, first and second graders. Um, my twelfth year. Other, 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 other. Okay. Um, maybe, um, Amy, you might want to exit the hangout and come back in. I should exit and come back in? <laughs> I don't know where that audio was coming from. Uh -huh. I think you're okay now, actually. Am I okay now? Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> I didn't do anything. No, I, I know. Weird things happen. <laughs> you know, I told me was trying to say that the school has, has autonomy that, that uh, other... Uh, uh, public schools um, don't necessarily have, but uh, it's still within the traditional uh, Boston public school system uh, under a structure they set up uh, about uh, 15 years ago or so. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, Genera is still getting herself settled. Uh, uh, Sam, maybe you want to come in there with some of the things that you've observed about Mission Hill coming from another outside pers perspective. So, um, so the Mission Hill is one of these schools where y if you want to see what just great teaching and learning looks like, and in particular if you want to see a community of adults that are really highly skilled highly transparent and highly committed to working with each other to get better all the time and to help kids. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen a school that that is as um, clear-eyed and supportive. And so what's exciting about this series and what led to it is the idea of trying to let as many people as possible see what a few of us are lucky enough to have been able to see and Genera is lucky enough to be able to, to work in and Bob is lucky enough to be able to send his child there and and, and so the, the hope is that the series will allow lots of people to be flies on a wall and to start to be witness to one community's particular approach to making sure that all people have a voice and learn to use their mind well and that hopefully that central story of a single school will seed lots of work and lots of stories of lots of other schools around the country. That's certainly the hope, at least. And um, I should say that not everybody who will be, you know, listening to this or watching this is currently on here. So if you are just listening, this is, uh, the website is a year at missionhill.com uh, for an introduction on the web anyway. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Um, but, you know, as an outsider, you know, one of the things I noticed that this is a very different school, and, and really it's, um, I guess I would say that it's connected. I mean, connected in so many ways that uh, the school emphasizes relationships. And, and then I see, like when I watch the videos, I see kids going out and working in community gardens. Uh, I see this uh, farm school, which I'd like to know a little bit more about. And then there's all these partnerships that you have within the community. So, um, I mean, that seems to be very different um, for, you know, a public school. So can someone talk a little bit about, like, you know, this whole connected nature of the school and the emphasis on relationships? How about Genera? Janera, are you able to talk? I can um, maybe speak to that a little bit when we wait for uh, Janera to rejoin. But uh, yeah, I mean the the 
teaching staff, uh, I think, is really at the core of it um, in terms of their philosophy um, and their interconnectedness, having um, kind of um, worked together a long time and, and um, a really um, invest the time in, in thinking about, um, you know, their um, their everyday experiences and really um, getting to know um, every child um, as an individual. And, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of the staff has, has kids at the school as well. And so that, I think that has a big impact. You know, they're not only teachers, but they're, they're parents. They have a really, a really valuable dual perspective and then the um, children are, at, are really um, experience the school as an interconnected community um, because there are um, every week there are school-wide sharing opportunities um, the whole school will engage in theme based and content based learning and so uh, you know my son has been involved in, in presentations you know to the school to, to share things that he's learned you know since he was um, five since he entered and know his kids, you know, uh, from his class all the way up through eighth grade, um, basically as, um, you know, as, as schoolmates. It's not an abstraction what's going on in the other schools and classes. They, um, you know, now and then, um, you know, have, um, you know, visit other classes. They're, they're very inter interconnected class to class and even, with, uh, even between grades. And it looks like we just had uh, Jabril or Jay join us. And you might be on mute. Yeah, Jay, you may have to unmute your microphone. <laughs> and uh, while we're waiting, can someone else just kind of describe the school culture just from an outsider's perspective? Oh. Give it a shot, David. Um, from what I've, I've learned about it, it's, and from, see, actually, I, I just got to spend some time with uh, the cohort of, mm -hmm. of teachers in Detroit at the North Dakota Study Group. And what I noticed right away is just their, the way that they um, talk to each other and are together. It seems like they're a cohort of, of learners also. And it feels like there's a, a good sense that, um, the way they talk to each other and the, the, the vocabulary they use and just the um, just the general sense you get is that these are people who know each other also in relationships and um, and that's something that has come through in the videos I think um, uh, there's a there's one scene in I think episode one or two where um, one of the teachers talks to the students about also being a learner and I think that is um, a good metaphor for their whole the, the culture is that everybody's seen as a learner there and not just the students not just the teachers but we're both oh you know what I think is happening in the background if someone's watching the stream live or if you don't have headphones if you could put on some headphones the students about the 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 Okay. Oh. Boy, somebody has a radio on in the background. I know that. Yeah, some kind of weird feedback. Yeah. I think it's gone now. No. Nope. I don't hear anything. Hmm. I can hear someone typing. Yeah. If you're not talking, if, if you could mute, that helps with the typing. But 
<laughs> so Sam just made the suggestion that we just go ahead and watch episode four, and then um, maybe we could do some more talking after it. It's a pretty powerful episode, and so mm -hmm. it would be a very good um, it would be a good segue into what we, from what we were talking about um, okay. to where we might want to go. So. And I am uh, looking for that. While I'm doing that, Monica, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you uh, know about these folks? About these folks here? Yeah. That keep rapping? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I'm part of um, IDEA, I guess, the organizing team for IDEA at the conference that will be in at CU Boulder um, in August, August 4th through 8th. Um, and I have seen this episode four, so I'm I'm thinking if we could run this, the it would you know promote some pretty incredible conversation. Um, I haven't visited this school. All I've seen, I've heard Sam just go crazy about the place and trust his judgment. Um, I've seen the episodes, and they've been um, pretty incredible. I think what David had to say about um, the people having a relationship. Um, and I don't remember who said it, but just the whole idea of it, it's a space where people are swimming in it themselves and not just preaching it, you know, so um, that seems to be pretty apparent. Um, uh, Amy, I'm glad you're on here. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything, because um, I've just loved watching your work as well, so. The, the reason that it's so important to show Mission Hill is not that Mission Hill has everything down. It's that Mission Hill, oops, it's that Mission Hill is doing the kind of work that that needs to be done in terms of integrating not only the active learning of children, but the empathetic learning of children and the building of community. Deb had in mind democracy when she started the school and and it shows. And that is something that people can take and move into their own situations. Okay. But that yeah. kind of one of the one of the responses that somebody posted somewhere was um, a mom and her daughter watching one of the episodes. Maybe somebody else can fill in here. But the point I wanted to make is, to me, what this is it's showing people, like Sam always says, a school that you know your dream school that you, you don't even think could possibly exist. Um, and I don't remember, maybe somebody else could fill in the details, but I thought that was pretty poignant that a young child was watching it and going, dang, this, this isn't just a dream, this is actually happening, I want to go there. Yeah, that was, um, that was actually Kim Ferris Berg, who's writing a recurring um, guest blog for my blog on Education Week. And what she was talking about, so she lives in Orange County. So, I mean, she lives in a very kind of high-income community, and yet her daughter, her nine-year-old, you know, basically it's worksheet after worksheet. So it was a very powerful way to kind of convey the point that here was a mother and daughter coming together, and actually she was just watching it because she was going to be writing about it, and then her daughter kind of heard some sounds and came over and sat in her lap and checked it out. And what became very apparent for the two of them was this stark um, contrast between the school that she went to and the school that they were seeing on TV. But actually, one thing that was really cool, and I assume you'll be able to see this in the comments of that blog on Ed Week, is lots of folks responded directly to Kim and said, hey, there's this school over here, and there's another place that you should check out. So actually, her making that thinking public has, I think, led to some new connections that she can make in her immediate area. And that, of course, that's the idea. Um, you know, the, the goal is not to just make every school Mission Hill. The goal is to have lots of schools that are as good as Mission Hill in lots of different ways. Okay. Can everybody uh, see that video now?
Walk into Mission Hill any day and you'll find children working and playing. Both are considered essential opportunities to talk to each other, figure things out together, and experience the rough edges of balancing one's own needs with those of others. Are you willing to solve whatever problem is happening? You're not? Oh, that's hard. I, you know what? I, I don't... Students need love, but they also, on the other hand, need this ceiling. Like, they need to know how far they can push you to feel safe. So I kind of look at that as love and limits. Sometimes you have a child who you're trying all different strategies with, and, and you, re you really um, just have to keep trying. You know, everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. But it's what you do after you've made those mistakes. Are we ready to move on? Can we still love each other? Can we still create this place where everybody has something to bring? What can you do to make you feel better? Mm, I hate Jake. So many things affect our desire to learn, and nothing impacts it more than our basic emotional readiness. From the youngest grades up, teachers at Mission Hill invest deeply in building bridges of empathy and understanding that everyone needs to become active, responsible members of a learning community. There are kids who need things emotionally. There are kids who might need just a physical touch. There are other students who are struggling with things at home. And there are students who are struggling with things that we don't particularly actually know or can actually label. I'm bringing her up because I'm not sure whether or not there is some kind of emotional attachment or if it is, yeah, I just kind of need a little bit of help thinking through it. Is, is this the child that you spoke to me about who has some characteristics of selective mutism? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of new research that has just come out about art therapy mm -hmm. and kids with extreme shyness or selective mutism, whatever they're sort of the same. I was thinking about whether we could offer support. Mission Hill has always had a wide range of students, but several years ago it became even more diverse when Boston designated it a full inclusion school. An inclusion school is a school that has children who might in other cases be in sub-separate or individually contained classrooms, but in this school they are integrated into the regular classrooms. There are some children with pretty significant learning issues. I mean, not just a small reading problem, but very significant learning issues. No, he's just not safe. We knew that, um, you know, having a substantially separate class was not in our makeup at all. So you could First, as a staff, we had to get ourselves together and really be on the same page and do some reading and learn from other people um, that were working with students with pretty significant needs. In working with Jaden, um, because of the way he processes sensory information, it's hard for him to take in all sorts of sensations at once. Okay, go ahead, Bruno. Who are you going to give a direction to first? No! Try again. I don't like to be yelled at, and I don't like to be charged at. So try again. One of Jaden's many strengths is reading. There's almost no word you put in front of Jaden that he can't read. So whatever kids are trying to figure out about Jaden, they're also knowing, Jaden can help me read. One of the things that is very exciting for me as a teacher is he would come in in the beginning of the year and he would play alongside. He was in his own world and now he's actually playing with children. Working with him in a group of peers, even though it's challenging for him, is really important. He's gotten progressively better and better all year. He's really developed in a great way. Do you like? What do you like? Academics don't exist in a vacuum. Yet a frequently held belief is that schools have to choose between children learning emotional literacy or learning to read a book. Schools like Mission Hill realize this is a false choice. Take a deep breath. I want you to ask her, ask her, look, what can I do to make you feel better about What can I do to make you feel better Well, you can play with me. 
The reality is that when you teach children to manage their emotions, they are more able to learn about such academic things as the wonders of ancient China. And what wonders they are, as you'll see next time in a year at Mission Hill. But just to, to bring forth some of the people in the uh, other chat, just uh, some of the comments that they said uh, were uh, academics don't exist in a vacuum. They really liked that, and they said that was very powerful um, and awesome. Who's our moderator? Chris, are you back? Yeah, yeah. So just wanted to make sure everything was good there. Um, so, you know, um, maybe we can hear from um, Amy. When you look at that video as, you know, the director, what, what kinds of things go through your mind? Whoop. Yeah, you guys. Am I on now? Now yes. I am. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, it, it goes on and off, but at any rate, uh, well, what goes through my mind is how many more examples I can't show <laughs> in a six-minute bite, and the the fact that you you have to see this as part of a a whole that is a community that believes that these things are important and therefore takes the time to make them happen. You can walk into a classroom and it could look really pretty in that classroom and there could be the same number of things happening uh, behind the scenes and they'd be invisible if the school does not make a point of allowing them to be visible. That doesn't mean that they're not there, but they're just not visible. And um, we've got a couple teachers here. What what are your thoughts when you see that? And David, um, mute your mute your mic. You're the mad typer, I'm guessing. And you guys, if you haven't yet, if you'll go back and click the YouTube on the left hand side, then your your screen will come back to normal again. So it's not highlighted. Uh, okay, Cor, how about you? Hey. Um, yeah, so um, this is my second time watching the, <clears throat> the video clip, um, the chapter four, and I just, you know, just saying to myself that this is, you know, just a great example of um, a school of teachers modeling um, true democratic education and that's even you know just this showing empathy and you know just um, being pretty humble and saying like I don't know what to do can you help me move forward um, and and taking that community of people that you have at your disposal to help build and create um, a better environment a learning experience students um, that spoke volumes you know um, and just having this as an example and seeing it as a possibility would also, you know, um, it'll, it'll, you know, put it out there that this is something that we can actually do. Now, maybe not exactly to a T, um, and maybe not scaling it for everybody, but, but something that sh should be looked at, um, especially when, you know, when we we want to grow the whole child, you know. One of my favorite think, books was about um, saying we shouldn't have to choose between emotional literacy and, and learning to read. Um, so say whatever if you want to jump in, but if somebody wants to address that, I would love that. Yeah. I'm and, gonna, and, um, go ahead, Janera, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to respond to what you were saying, okay, Cor. I think um, it's really important as folks watch these clips um, and even as I watch it um, to remember that um, you, you don't have to jump feet first into this type of learning and this type of teaching um, that there are things that folks can do little by little 
um, in their classrooms, um, even with just one child, um, that can make a difference in the beginning. Um, and that, you know, a lot of times folks say, oh, well, that's great for your school and our school could never do that because. Um, and I think that that last phrase has to be retracted in a way that I could look at it. Um, and so that change begins to happen that way. Um, and um, Monica, in response to what you were saying, you know, I think this is one of the huge, huge missing pieces um, of the way most kids are educated today is that they remove that emotional piece or they try to um, and they just see it as this totally <laughs> totally separate issue um, if you're having some kind of emotional difficulty you leave the classroom and you go see someone right as opposed to um, well let's let's figure it out because this is really the crux um, am I trying to say we, we can't get to anything else before we deal with that emotional thing and the person who's closest to the child should be really trying to help them deal with that thing um, in conjunction with family in conjunction with other um, staff or, or colleagues in conjunction yeah I wonder if I could um, add something to what um, more parts or more. Uh, almost done, Bob. I wish oh, no, there no, were more you. clips <laughs> that show the adults having these same kinds of conversations. Yeah, I mean, as Janelle was um, speaking about that, I, I was just thinking about the fact uh, a number of times, you know. Um, our son has will come home and say, "Oh, um, such and such was having a hard day today because X and Y. It's hard for him when this happens, but they're they're work. You know, um, you know, my my teacher was working with him on that, and we're we're also we're making sure that you know we we play these games with him. Or so what I I wanted to note is that when the child is not kind of shunted out of the classroom because they're having some kind of challenge, um, the other kids actually learn um, a lot from that experience of resolving problems, um, you know, in, in real time uh, in front of their eyes and, and how they can contribute to that. Um, one of the things I notice, um, you know, as I'm looking at this is, you know, I see a lot of John Dewey in here. I see classrooms where kids are making things um, and they're really engaged. Uh, you know, how much does, you know, what does progressive mean to you? What is the John Dewey background? How much does that inform what you do? Because to me, it seems like, you know, a lot of, of that I, I see in this. We're talking about progressive education. Yeah, I mean, We're definitely talking about progressive, progressive education. Progressive and and go ahead. Oops, now I've lost everybody. No, you oh, just we just lost here. Genera. Just uh, yeah, go on, Amy. What were you going to say? I, what, what I was going to say is we we definitely you know we haven't given a definition of what how this school works but basically uh, we're looking at progressive education we're looking at Dewey's ideas one way that Dewey's ideas have been implemented and uh, and that includes the the emotional world of, of the people who are who are in the classroom and it also includes hands-on learning and uh, this particular episode doesn't focus very much on that but you can't separate these things when you see Jaden working in the bakery he's learning hands-on he's learning about the bakery and he's also learning how to interact socially they aren't little pieces that you can put on a line they are a whole and that's what Dewey was talking about and that's what a lot of us want to 
be able to do in the classroom, <laughs> which we're not always able to do because people are trying to put things in boxes. Mm -hmm. I think we have Jane, uh, Janera back, and uh, so maybe she wants to add something to that. So, I mean, I go ahead. So, hopefully, I won't. I will stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So, the school definitely—it's—it's it's, you know—it's almost a breathing organism of um, some of Dewey's ideas um, and his his theories and his philosophy of you know how education should be enacted in our schools um, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about Dewey too is also you know the idea of using objects as a as a means of learning and and we see that and I think it's in chapter three where the students are touching the seaweed and they're 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 um, smelling it and or they're watching the, the the bees and and they're going out into the garden um, all of this is what Dewey had envisioned you know um, in his diagrams he's got you know he's got the different learning spaces that you have and then in the middle is that either the library or the museum like of learning um, and that's where you bring all your ideas and all your thoughts and all your all the things that you've actually constructed together as a group as a community and you bring it for everyone to see your your school should be a reflection of what the things that you display in your school should be a reflection of what your community looks like and then we see that going on um, in, in, in Mission Hill which you know, um, sometimes you know it's when people talk about the progresses and, and the reforms, it's you know some people say, well, do we actually lost during that time? But in actuality, we're seeing a, a you know a revival of Dewey's ideas more so now than ever that I can say, um, and it's and it's becoming more um, people. There's a hunger for it because people are so burnt out and 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 knocked down by the the others that are kind of. Um, draining, draining us, and and you know, putting a hamper on um, learning, um, and it fosters true creativity and true curiosity and 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 true inquiry, you know, in ways that you know that I interpret Dewey has had envisioned. One thing I like about the um, series is that, like, I know a lot about Dewey, and I know a lot about all the people who came after him that adapted him and Deborah Myers. Um, but what I've seen in the four episodes is that you don't have to know anything about any of those philosophers, and, but you can just see what real learning can look like. Um, what It's messy. It's not... doesn't happen on desks. It doesn't happen um, in ways that are always quiet or... Um, can be are the same every day. I mean, those scenes where the students are kind of um, experiencing their learning in a very uh, kind of vocal and angry way is, to me, some of the best examples of what learning looks like. It's not always clean or straight or happy or fun. Like sometimes it's really messy and angry, and people cry and. And that's what I get out of this, and that's why I like this because I can. It, it kind of sh makes it simple and complex at the same time. It, you don't have to know Dewey to know that that feels right. Oh. I have a kind of a burning question for Janera, and I, I also asked this of Ayla, and she's gonna send me an email later. But you know, at one point in this chapter, Ayla says like we became a full inclusion school and it seemed like it was so there was a before and an after is what it sounds like and and then she says and so we realized we had to we had to read we had to learn from folks and so I'm just curious what what when was that before and after what was that shift like and who did you read and who did you learn from yeah um, so before I guess the before or I think someone in the video also said, you know, or maybe it was you, Sam, in your narration talked about like there's always this range of learners, right? Um, and and now we talk about it like, oh, we always had an inclusion school. We just didn't have as many children with labels, right? Um, 
but there came a time in the district when um, they were moving to this full inclusion model and our other schools before us um, started having, um, sorry, uh, before the full inclusion, there were all these substantially separate classrooms and there still are. Um, and then they started to go to the full inclusion and we got a group of students who came with uh, different designations that, um, yeah, I'll just say that. They, they came with these specific designations. And we decided as a school that year um, to have a substantially separate classroom. And this was the first time we had ever done anything like this. And it, actually, Kathy was the, the teacher. Um, who and what was, year you know, was that, Jeanette? had that you, classroom. Do you remember what and year was that? though it worked out for that, oh, I, I know, I can't remember. Fifth grade now. So that was probably six years ago. Um, and, you know, we, we got through the year, and it was painfully evident that those, as much as we tried as a community to have them not as a substantially separate classroom, that they really kind of were. Um, mostly because there weren't there weren't a mix of children like the rest of our classrooms. It felt really different. Um, and so we scratched that and we um, said, okay, we're, we're not going to have substantially separate. And we started um, the, the new groups of kids that came in, we started spreading them between the K classroom as opposed to having one substantially separate classroom. So what I'd like to point out is that uh, is exactly the way Ingenera just talked about that. We tried something. It didn't seem to be who we were and it didn't meet the needs of our community. So we changed. And that is such an important part of uh, what we wanted to show when we started making this film. That a community of teachers, a community of adults and children together knows, can, can can be empowered to do the things that are right for that community. So there was always a range of children with you know, many, many, many different parts of themselves. But when, uh, when the school was expanded to be taking children who had been labeled much more clearly, that was, that was something new. And rather than saying, OK, we'll do it. This is, we've started this, so we have to continue this. They said, what's happening with these actual children? What's happening in our situation? And teachers had the ability to make changes. Big, really big. One of the things we did was go to um, some other um, Boston schools, actually, um, and take a look at um, how they were doing inclusion um, or, or what they called inclusion and realized there was a lots of different ways that looked. Um, none of them quite like us. Um, and, but it was helpful to just see what was out there and what other folks were doing. Um, what's interesting to me now as I think back about it, um, I don't feel like we're doing a lot different than we were. I think in that. Um, oh no! In the beginning, don't leave us hanging on that. Maybe even right. us as a staff had this idea. Oh, we, we're getting these. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you you disappeared for a moment, but you're back. Okay, so I was going to say, I think um, now that I look back on it, I don't think we've done so much different, you know. I think in the moment we 
we heard these words like inclusion and substantially separate and it kind of you know took us aback a little bit um and after that one year of that substantially separate classroom we kind of went back to uh what we do normally and that's what felt right and still feels right um and so yeah it's kind of like just going back to what we know what we knew what we now still know works uh, for all kids and not just kids who um, come with these different designations. Amy, I think you're on mute. Mm -hmm. Now am I there? Can you hear me yes. now? Yes. yes. So Bob talked a yes. little bit about how, what happens when his son comes home and uh, tells him about the day. And I know uh, that parents could be concerned about a classroom where there were children having problems. We have this idea that a classroom should look, as David said, you know, there, that it should it that it should look like learning is happening. And we have this idea about what learning looks like. So I'm wondering if what kind of help you feel you've gotten to from the school to understand this other piece that uh, and because I think that that's a piece if this model is to go other places parents have to feel comfortable about it about problems happening about children uh, having a bigger range of emotional life that's brought into the classroom. Yes. Um, let's see. I, I think uh, personally, I, I uh, you know had a certain um, um, upfront appreciation of the emphasis on on social and and peer uh, learning. Um, that just makes sense to me. I think that's something that serves kids well, um, really throughout their lives, to know um, how to work well with other people. And um, think about problems as something kind of that you can talk about and and work through. Um, I think that um, I guess as parents um, come into the school, um, definitely uh, Mission Hill works hard to try and um, articulate the philosophy of individual learning. Um, each child is as unique, um, you know, and that means people learning at different paces different learning styles and um, different things that you're trying to work through with the kids and that's all kind of a fodder for, for learning. Um, right, that, that's, um, that's sort of a, a subject matter, like oh, given that we're, given that we're having this trouble, what, what can we learn, how can we help this person with it? A little off topic, but I had a question about the farm school. You know, in the video, it's it's this is Boston, right? And then uh, it, it there's this mention of the farm school where I see kids out there tilling the soil and um, you know learning about uh, you know uh, gardening or farming. Um, and and then it seems like yeah. that's actually a place where the teachers get together and have real meaningful times too. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the farm school, we've had a connection with the farm school um, from the very beginning of the school. It's an Athol Mass. Um, and the way our program is set up now, um, all kids um, from the smallest to the oldest go to the farm school every year. Um, from third grade down, they just go for the day. Um, and their day is spent working on different parts of the farm um, and learning how to do different things. And the older kids go for three, three days and two nights. They stay on the farm and they um, are essentially farm hands for that time. Um, and as far as the staff, um, we use it for our retreats. Um, usually the one that we do um, when we come back to school in 
in August. Um, and there's also, you know, the the farm school folks come to Mission Hill. Um, they help us plant. They help us harvest. Um, we had a, I don't know if it's still happening this year, but um, when we were in the old building, they would bring uh, produce from the farm to include in um, in our lunches uh, for the kids. Um, it's a really strong, wonderful connection. I ask because it seems like that underlies a lot of what you do back at school, though, too, because a lot of the education, you know, I noticed about the bee fair and, um, you know, a number of the things you do are, are really about connecting to nature. That seems to be a really important point. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, a, I think a lot of folks on staff just, just naturally are lovers of the environment, and so that just kind of naturally comes in. Um, the beehive is in my classroom, um, and 10 years ago when I, um, when I got it, I knew nothing about honeybees. Had, I wasn't really interested at all. And then my colleague, um, Heidi Line, had it installed in her classroom, and I fell in love. I was in her classroom every day, right? <laughs> um, and she said, well, you should take it. You should have the bees. And it, it came to my classroom. It's been there ever since. Um, and for me, that's just a really powerful learning story for me that then I transferred it to the kids, right? So I know nothing about this and just seeing it, just being in front of it, just, um, watching, learning bit by bit how this works has drawn me into like a lifelong love affair with the honeybee, um, a lifelong learner of the honeybee and it's the same thing for the kids, right? You get their hands on something, you get them to see it, you get them to feel it, and they're, they're drawn in, and their own curiosities, um, that's what drives them to, to learn more about it. Um, we actually have, um, we helped a Fenway High School get um, a beehive. They now have one, so they're, they're two. And um, we started an organization called Classroom Hives, Inc., where we are consultants for um, mostly... I've lost her. Anybody else? Yeah. I think that's a really great yeah. story to end on and leave yeah. us with our curiosities as well. Um, so yeah, and it, before we have some last mm -hmm. thoughts, um, we always do want to thank, and, and we can come back for some closing thoughts, but before we go, we always want to thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo and um, the nice people at World Bridges and EdTech Talk. Um, but, you know, I don't want to just cut off at that point. That whole thing about, you know, like the infectious learning that she has with her students. Um, you know, does anyone want to uh, mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that as we close? Like, what is it that's, you know, makes it a great place to go to school or a great place to teach? I guess, again, the, the idea that adults and children are in contact with each other in a learning environment, that, that it's that uh, that idea of adult mentors is bigger than just the one classroom, is a school-wide phenomenon, and that that excitement can be shared uh, in all its forms, which includes learning how to deal with emotional issues, which was the big theme of Chapter 4, but it, it includes learning about bees and learning about China and being excited yourself as an adult and kids getting that experience. I don't know if we have time for this, but a question from the, the other chat was, how do you have that kind of learning um, uh, with like the testing and stuff? And if you can just maybe talk about <laughs> how, how that is affected mm -hmm. at all in, in Mission Hill. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of the yeah, the Dr. Seuss book, Hooray for Diffin Duver Day, <laughs> where they, they, they uh, you know, 
they're doing all this wonderful stuff, and then the test comes, and they, they're so afraid, and they didn't prepare, and are we going to do well, and then, you know, they aced it. But, you know, the, the MCAS is what it's called in Massachusetts. It's, it's real. Um, we have to give it. We do give it. We prepare yeah. students for it, and we don't let it consume us. Um, yay, there it is! <laughs> <laughs> Um, we we don't let it consume us. Um. And luckily, at this point, it hasn't consumed them. But it is. I think it's something that's. It's a real threat. It's always there as a threat that somebody could it's make a bigger deal about this it. One really. <laughs> yeah. It is real, right? Bob, as a parent, do you want to add your perspective? Do you do you worry about your kids' pre preparation for standardized tests? Um, no, uh, I think that uh, if uh, they have a, a love of learning, um, which they do, uh, you know, being a uh, our son being around, um, you know, amazing teachers like like Chinera and, uh, and and many others, um, you know, they um, are uh, excited about learning things, whether it's uh, whether it's math or or uh, bees or um, how uh, or, or the world of work, which I think is a, a later video. So um, I think they're well prepared um, socially and um, and personally, not worried about uh, um, any um, uh, you know any test implications. Um, I'm more worried about testing, you know, taking away time that would be better spent um, with their teachers, um, kind of doing the learning that that Mission Hill School uh, does very well. Uh, anybody want, Monica, some closing thoughts as we go? I'd like to leave it open to Sam or someone else that, you know, might have a, have a thought. Um, I think you're the only one that hasn't talked a whole lot here, Sam, so why don't you take us out? Um, actually, I want to do the one-two punch if I can, which is to say something briefly and then pivot to a question that someone was asking via Twitter that Amy is best positioned to answer. <laughs> so, um, so to me, what's exciting about this series is it, it demonstrates very powerfully that, you know, up to this point, generally speaking, we've believed that content is the end goal of schooling, that the only thing that matters in Janeris classroom is what those kids actually learn about bees and whether they can regurgitate it. Whereas what Mission Hill understands is that content, whether it's a honeybee or ancient China, is actually just the means by which we get kids excited about learning. And to me, that is a, um, a massive shift that all of us are trying to get more people to see and to act on. But the, the question that came from Twitter was somebody wanting to know more about the filmmaking process. And so, Amy, would you maybe just share a little bit about that for folks before we all disappear to our respective corners of the world? Tiny bit. Uh, if, uh, uh, so my husband, Tom, uh, is a documentary filmmaker. And having spent a year filming in my classroom, making the film August to June, he and I had already developed an idea about how to be in a room with children and, uh, and all the activity that's happening, uh, and to make ourselves invisible. And the first thing that we did at Mission Hill was introduce ourselves to all the children, show them our equipment, explain what we were doing, and then ask them to ignore us. And of course, some of them didn't ignore us for a while, but after a bit, it gets pretty boring to, uh, to watch somebody with the camera, and they, they did ignore us. We became invisible. Unfortunately, we live in California, and Mission Hill is in Boston, so we weren't there all year. We came and went. We were there for three weeks at a time, uh, basically four times in the course of the year. Uh, and, and I wish we could have been there every minute. But as it is, uh, we focused on the things that we knew were important to show in our minds, and then just let school happen around us because you never knew what was going to happen next. And luckily, lots of things happened and we caught some of them. 
Did that do it? <laughs> it's been good to talk with you. I hope that, uh, that this is helpful to others and that uh, as you watch the series, that you, as questions come up, write them to a year at Mission Hills site, write them to my blog uh, at August to June, write them to Facebook, and let's, let's keep this moving so that it goes beyond Mission Hill and has an impact on getting our priorities straight for, straight for our kids. Amen. Yeah, thanks Thank so you. much, you guys, for coming and for all the work you're doing. Love it. The, uh, the website, again, is yearatmissionhill.com. Uh, com. And the hashtag is year at Mission Hill, uh, year, year at MH. Year at MH. And Facebook is Facebook, a year at Mission Hill. Go ahead and like us. And we have content coming out almost every day on that uh, Facebook page. So uh, stay in tune there. And feel free to ask any questions. We have a Twitter chat tomorrow at 6 o'clock, same time. Tomorrow um, we'll be talking ab also be talking about episode four. So, find and out. the Prezi for Mission Hill just passed one hundred thousand views in its first month. So nice. Pretty good. Yay. <laughs> oh wait, let's, let's get a clap. I'm sorry, I'm going to Yay. need to clap for that. <laughs> yeah. Bye everybody. Bye. Right. Bye. Right. Bye. Oh yeah, there it goes. <laughs> bye bye bye